start a new project with Redis? And I was like, no. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, so uh, I just started you. recording. Yeah. And uh, welcome to Augur 8 Knot, March 25th. We're talking about Redis changing its licensing terms. We sure are. Yeah. Um, and from the sound of things, this also impacts 8 Knot. We do still use it. Um, and so that will probably be the next thing that's going to become a pretty big thing for eight knot. Um, I will say going into kind of as a prefix going into like these auger eight knot discussions is that I would say we're on the eight knot side going to be jumping to focus really heavily on cleaning up all tech debt this is going to fall this is going to end like so now this is going to be the talk of that list switching from docker to Podman, um and yeah. then like there's a bunch of so pretty much there's a bunch of different stuff i still want to be working on the design stuff that we've been talking about that's like still front of mind but i would say from a technical development standpoint that's where we're going to be focusing for the next couple of weeks just to make sure for like just to make sure all of that's stabilized and we're in a really good stop um spot from like a back end development standpoint before starting to work on the redesign from a technical perspective. So those are some updates from my side. Okay. We do uh, have um, Redis. It's not a we think it is a Oh okay. No, I, I have always, terms of games. I'd also love to hear in more conversations uh, in the weeks to come because I'm going to report back here with some Redis alternatives that we're thinking about and that I'd be happy to contribute back to a project that is giving me a lot of ability to gather metrics. Um, if you find something that you think is a good option, please share. <laughs> we can have a lively discussion about which one makes the most sense. Yeah, I mean, not not using an OSI compliant license, of course, has there's the value system of open source, but there's also, I think, uh, if that doesn't move you, the reality of what that kind of change signals from a project yeah. ought to move you, right? Because the likelihood that Redis will continue to make itself available free of charge uh, is now substantially lower. Well, they eventually they're going to stop supporting. They they have already mentioned. I think it's part of that article that I posted that they will not be supporting the open source version past a certain point. Yeah. Like it won't even get security updates pretty uh, within the next couple of years. Yeah, and that so that um, that yeah. that's killing the open source project. So that you'll buy like or use and buy the uh, enterprise alternative, and you know, there's all kinds of angles to that, but. Gary, you mentioned at the at outset there was a uh, an alternative. There was one specific alternative that you mentioned. I just wanted to yeah. capture that. Yeah, one alternative that seems to be the leader right now is um, Snapchat's KeyDB, but that might be a little premature to uh, declare as the winner because Redis being as big a project as it is, we've seen like Open Tofu manifest when Terraform did what Terraform did. It's possible that other uh, folks might step up and say, actually, I'm going to make this grand, brand new project and it's going to be called Jettis and it's definitely not Redis. <laughs> uh, and that it gives me that. It, so, so we have a rare opportunity to create a fork of a project and build momentum around it and give it a name. Um, yeah, I should I should call it. Um, uh, I should I should do one and call it something like uh, Vetus that's focused on viability. I like that. I'm sitting here trying to think of a clever name for a project that has some Redis-ish mnemonic to it. Just do an anagram. Mm -hmm. Although I don't know what the etymology of the word Redis is. So. Reads? <laughs> Reads. 
that's good. That's actually a good one. <laughs> uh, all right. Yeah, I mean, I, I have a friend, Reed. He would love that. And then, uh, okay, so Gary, your second item, uh, how to capture some auger metrics, namely these. Yeah, when I was looking through the documentation, um, I noticed that on many of these linked, uh, if you scroll down a little bit, there's just like a small list of the, there you go, it was right up there. Yeah, there too. Um, they're linked in a couple of places. Uh, so when you look on the metrics pages, they mentioned that they are measurable in Augur. And mm -hmm. then I go into the documentation and I try to like find the obvious like uh, analogous measure. And I'm having trouble just in the documentation itself, I think for Augur. Yeah. So I wanted to just quickly poke if there's metrics you know I can gather and then uh, throw into a model, then I would I would be happy to do that. Yeah, we have all of these specific metrics that are noted in this particular model. I think what I need to do is one of the one of the tasks that comes to this group, which we haven't discussed in a while, is updating Augur's documentation. So last fall, uh, the Chaos Project, I'm going to say this finally uh determined that they would use consistent urls across time for all of the metrics historically auger had spent years updating the the links in our documentation to the chaos metrics that corresponded and chaos project kept changing the urls because they were we were changing the website and so right. we stopped and uh so now you have to go through all like hundred some endpoints and remap them to the permanent URLs. So these all these metrics do in fact exist within Augur. However, the documentation doesn't make it easy to identify the these the pointers to them, like which which endpoint corresponds with which thing is not entirely clear always. Okay. Um I would I, this can be like an offline. I can post this list of like, hey, can you chuck me a link to how to gather this? Yeah, and then yeah. I, yeah, most of these is, yeah, I was going to say most of these as well are um, like a part of 8 knot. Yeah. So mm -hmm. if you wanted to use that as, or even just to look at what queries are done and as you can kind of take from there, um, bus factor, elephant factor, um and those, are, those are queries actually against the database or are they against the mm -hmm. other yeah. api okay all of yeah everything that's in eight knot is um via like yeah queries um and so we do pretty much all of that but i think this kind of goes on to this is a little bit different because it's uh, along with the metric models but um, a push that I've been trying to do towards getting the Augur schema documentation up to date. Okay. Uh, and that's actually what we focused on last week is uh, Augur documentation and the schema. It's very exciting. Yeah. I'm thrilled just hearing it. No, I have a rising. I've, I've like, uh, it was for a couple of years, possibly Callie the, being the only person asking for this. And now I have... Uh, many more people asking for this. So I have started a a project uh, to document the schema. Mm. And I need to figure out, so there's obviously the end result is some more formal documentation. I think there, there are, as I go through it with different parties, inter, I would characterize it maybe as intermediate documentation that takes the form of notes and various discussions that can be made available. And I'm trying to think of a way to make them available without the pretense of being formal documentation, but with the pretense of, hey, here's some useful information about how to get the data that answers your questions out of Augur. And I don't know if a, a series of blog posts is the right intermediate artifact or if anyone has some specific suggestions about, you know, as so putting together the documentation, that's obviously a more formal process. We want to ensure that everything is structured the same, has all the same information. 
when I'm talking with people about how do I get this out of Augur, or how do I get that out of Augur, I'm taking notes that usually includes a definition of what's in a particular table or tables, as well as some queries for extracting the results that will answer specific questions. So cool. that I, I think is useful as an intermediate product because formalizing it and standardizing it's a second process or a second step. I right. think that that's actually the first step, in my opinion. Huh? I think that the standardization of the documentation, like at a very like system, like what is each column? In my opinion, that's the first step. And then doing like the secondary things that is like useful. And I think is like a nice tool and things for people to have. But if you don't have like that initial documentation of like what is in each column, then it's very difficult, I think, to use Augur um, versus if you have the the secondary documentation, you're like, here's some examples, like that's great. But I think that in my opinion, that's a secondary, that'd be the secondary round of it. So the, the pragmatics are that that ends up, the secondary round of it ends up being the first thing that's happening because it's answering specific questions that people have. So I have that second round and it, I think it would be better use. It'd be more useful than not to make the notes from that available in some way while I, the I agree. first priority is getting developed. Yeah. I, I can also throw a little bit of weight uh, and effort into this because um, based on Callie's comment, I'll take a look through eight knot and try to find some specific code samples. And then um make sure I make note of those so that when we, if we want to write a blog post, then I can reference those code samples. And Sean, since you're a lot more familiar with the API, maybe we can have like a, a pincer kind of blog post where we're talking mm -hmm. about the queries that we can do and the API calls that we can do to get even just this model. Um, I can definitely swing that as making time to publicize viability on my end. So I would be happy to help contribute that way. I don't know if that tips the scales one way or another that the secondary action can come first because it's like pseudo parallelized versus uh, then Sean, you have a lot more time to focus on documentation. Yeah, I think working, I think making the things that are in separate, not public places available is a, is helpful. It's more helpful than not. So right. uh, I don't know if there's... I agree with Callie that in the in a better world, the first stuff, the the column by column descriptions come first. Um, I try to think of a way to do this iteratively, where it's uh, yeah, and I'm I've, hmm. and I've I've told you before, like, I'm very happy to help with that process, the doing the awesome. direct documentation. Um, that is like. Does, Something that I'm, I'm very... would, would, does it make sense to do it? Like we use restructured text in the Augur docs and <clears throat> I'm trying to think, I mean, does it make sense to put these incremental things into the docs in some manner? My only um, reservation but... is the docs are a bit overwhelming already. I mean, I think that if you have a tab that says like, like analysis and query examples and, and you put that... And that's where all of this goes. That would I feel like that would be a logical place in the documentation for this to go. And do, even do you think? Like, it... like... Sorry, go ahead, Kelly. Yeah, I just I mean it just links to the anal like different analysis examples. Um, I'm going back to some of the other conversations that I've had with like Josh Burkus about how we would want to. Um, comment it or like how you would want to go about commenting the table itself and it seems like for postgres you want to go about because like some of the columns already have it when you like hover over different columns in a database editor it does give a description it's just having yeah. that exists for all of them hmm. 
And then most of the tools that will reproduce the schema and create document, like create like kind of like table, column, column information. Like that's something that will be automatic, could be automatically generated once that information is in the database, like as a part of Augur. Mm -hmm. Like like a a tool sort of like a Swagger that would do that for Postgres, you mean? I, I'm not familiar with Swagger, so I can't oh, okay. like speak directly to that. I just know that there's a lot of like if you look at the like the on the documentation for Augur right now, the thing that produces like the mapping of how the tables are connected and the lines between them. There's mm -hmm. like a part of that is also they'll show like table columns, um, columns and then column descriptors. And so that can all be produced together. Like it's not something that you have to make an addition to. It's just a like exporting kind of fashion. That makes sense. Um, Gary, you mentioned Swagger. I have heard that tool name before, and I can't remember the full context of what Swagger is. E Sorry. Uh, Swagger being an API documentation tool that you can stand up next uh, to like a Flask app or next to a bunch of um, Java. It, Java Spring is a big adopter of it. it. It's basically like when you write your code, then Swagger will give you the automatic documentation, kind of like what we're talking about with Postgres and yes. the description fields. So I'm that thinking, big... yeah, it, based on your answer, the answer to my question was yes. I was this just referencing technology. Yep, exactly. Yeah, okay, Schema Spy, let me look at that. I think, I suspect that it's the same, because ever since ORMs mm -hmm. became a big thing, like this is a common pattern that you write it a certain way and then you get all these nice things from it. Exactly. Yeah, it's exactly like this. That's a buffer databases instead of APIs. Also got really popular when like GraphQL was super fun and cool and everybody was doing gRPC and then we were like, oh, wait, REST isn't as bad as we thought it was. <laughs> um, before I get away from it, I to just show you, Gary, the um, eight knots pretty nicely architected insofar as all the queries are oh, yeah. in pla one place. And so under the eight knot, eight knot directory, there is a queries folder. Okay. And in here is where you will find the giant cache of already performed queries with reasonably good names that describe what the queries themselves do. In some cases, there's more than meets the eye beyond what the name is. So I'll just leave that teaser there. Uh, yeah. okay. And then every visualization has hmm. the query it uses imported. So you'll be able to see at the top of the um, of the visualization what query goes into it. Right. So if you look at the pages directory, each of these is a page that you may recognize for the most part inside of 8 Right. And if you drop off one of these, you'll see a visualizations folder in each of them. Mm -hmm. And on each visualization Python file, um, you will see that it's importing a query. So here on this one, you can see the contributors query is imported, which implies quite accurately that the contributors query file that I was in just a minute right, ago right. is the one that's used on this page. So if you go through an 8NAT instance and find yeah. something that's what you want, you can just back backwards navigate to where that visualization is to find the right query. That sounds amazing. And I, I actually even see bus factor teased on yes. line 38. So I can, <laughs> I can crawl through this and pull out what yes. I need. Uh, so I want factor but... is also referred to as lottery factor on here because sure. the implications of bus factor we've been they're a little dark they're a little dark yeah and so instead <laughs> we use which is the same thing somebody right. wins a lottery totally beat you to it Sean I already put it there um, oh, I think uh, one thing I want to say because I do have a ten thirty is I just want to wrap up and and mention that I am willing to contribute whatever I find as like a blog post on chaos. Uh, if we're interested in doing that, Callie, I know you had mentioned that it might be something that fits better in the Augur documentation. Do you have a strong opinion about that? Oh, I was just saying that could be linked into the dog, um, Augur documentation. Like there's like a section where it's like examples of Augur being used or stuff like that, where the people can see example use cases of queries to visualizations in whatever format that is. So then it's like okay. in 
yeah so i i like it being under like the chaos blog and then there, there being a place just in the auger documentation specifically that kind of has all that stuff rounded up because i think people really can benefit on having like example use cases Totally agree. And the other side of that is, uh, Callie, would you like to be a contributor to that? Sean, I assume you already have the ability to be a contributor. I just want to make sure, Callie, if you want to, that we get you set up to do that. Yeah. Contributor to the... Like a, if we blog. did a blog post, mm -hmm. would you want to be able to edit it like on WordPress or would you rather like be um, credited as somebody who helped contribute to the blog post? Like how much involvement I've, would you like there? Yeah, I've never used WordPress before, so I'm not 100% sure. I definitely, in an idealistic world, would love to be very involved in this. I will say okay. that I won't really know how, I don't really know what things are going to look like for me um, workload-wise, and I will have a better idea of that in a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, as it goes, I'll just keep you in the loop. I just don't want to, yeah. you know. Your, your work has a lot to do with what we're going to be writing. So I don't want to be like, and also Callie wrote all this code and I'm referencing it. And good for you. <laughs> um, yes. I, and I also don't want this to only be a thing that you are having. I'd, I'd rather help collaborate than just pass it off to you. Totally. All right. I have that 1030, but thank you so much for giving right. me so much of this meeting. I will see you again soon. All right. Thanks, Gary. All right. Bye. Um, I think... James says that he's coming over to this meeting. He's just getting out of a 1030. So then at least maybe we can talk a little bit more about design stuff. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I've I... never, I, I see that Lamy's here. Um, not, yeah. I don't know if there's anything that we want to talk about more. Yeah. It's probably or... good to refresh ourselves because we had a lot of conference activity between two weeks ago and now where I think, in short, I don't know that we've um, on the Augur project had any chance to look at um, or, or you know, we haven't had any chance to um, accomplish anything uh, in reference to the design. So it might be good to refresh ourselves. Lami, well, mean, I don't know if you're able to talk or, or share a little bit again, or if there have been any changes. I think I think you gave us a reasonably good starting point the last time we talked a couple weeks ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. So the changes have been minimal because um, on my end, I wasn't able to do much last week. Um, but I worked on uh, a dark mode, and I think I prefer that for the dashboard. So if you would want to check that... And then I created some logo variations. I did that, um, I forgot to ask last time. So um, I'd like your opinions on which ones you would. Oh, yes, I see the dark mode. Hmm. Yeah, let's, I want to give like maybe a minute or two more to let James hop in. Yeah, yeah, yeah we can. There, just because I know that he'll have sure. a lot of thoughts and opinions and he's also the one the most experienced with applying um like pragmatically CSS and like boots and bootstrap um like styling on top of our current architecture so he'll be able i think he'll be able to see a lot more of being like oh i know how how this would how we'd be able to do this um more so than i will right on the spot i need to do a little bit more research sure he, sure yeah yeah, let's, we can give James a little bit of time here. Um, Sean, an easier way to zoom in. Are you using a mouse or in your trackpad? I am, um, yeah, but I, because I'm on the web version, I don't think the usual zooming works. No, that wasn't it. So are we wait. Oh, there's James. Hello, James. We have been waiting for you. <laughs> Hello. Sorry. Uh, Not for a half an hour, for like 30 seconds, <laughs> but. <laughs> cool. Hello, everybody. Hey James, how are you? Uh, 
stress as hell, but going mm. okay otherwise. How are you guys yeah. doing? I think we're good. Um, Lami had just brought up the design stuff and Callie thought it would be good if we just waited a second for you to join us. One thing that Lami mentioned initially is that she's done a bit of a dark mode example. And I don't know if uh, you want to walk us through this, Lami, and share your screen or if... Uh... Uh, can you click my profile picture? <clears throat> yes, I can. I can. Let's see and what happens. Click to follow. Ooh, yeah. wow. That's cool. <laughs> All right. Uh, oh, my God. Yeah, I've never really seen anything like just, this before. Can I just <laughs> say real quick, this is okay. beyond, like, I could not have come up with anything even remotely competitive with how good this looks <laughs> in, like, a month of Sundays. It looks so Are we talking good. about the 8-knot design? Or are we talking about how yeah. cool it is that Figma lets me click on Lamy and she has control? <laughs> no, the, the like dark mode looks great, light mode looks great. I love the blend of the chaos colors in it. There's it's just so fantastic. So I want to just say a quick thank you for all of your work on this. It's so incredibly appreciated. Thank you very much. Very happy to hear that. Uh, okay, so I'll start from the landing page. I'm not sure you've seen this. Um, so yeah, we... I've seen this. Okay, okay. Uh, so this is the dashboard where visualizations mm. were shown. And um, I changed it up a bit from how it was the last time. Just mm -hmm. so, because I, I just think this looks better. Mm. Uh so this a selected um category would now be highlighted rather than just changing the color uh -huh. just to make it um, obvious more obvious that this has been selected and then um, it stands out more in the dark mode than it does in the light mode for what that's worth okay maybe i would um, mm. I mean, don't you think? Is ever yeah. am I the only one that thinks that? Like I can it's much more clear to I mean it's not like it's unclear in the other one. It's just it seems to pop more in dark mode. Yeah. What is selected. And I, was, mm. I was thinking of going with either one, not both. But mm. um going with dark mode means users come from like a very bright screen mm -hmm. to a very, very dark one. So I was worried about how that would look. Or um, if you want to have like both modes, then maybe I could add a button to switch between the dark and light mode. And then in that case, I would need to create dark mode for all of these pages. So I think um, you know, this is just scoping the work. I think that maybe our first priority, at least my first priority, would be like concentrating on a dark mode because that's where we already are and the functionality for the app framework that we're using to switch between dark and light is mm -hmm. enough extra work that i would probably prefer to start out dark mode and then later on figure out how to do that switch because i think a lot of people prefer dark mode and it's just easier to get started there and that's, that's just my take though what do you think kelly uh, Yeah, I think that it would be best to start with dark mode. And then if the concern is to um, have like the entry screens are light and then the like visualization pages are dark, that we should just do the design for those like that initial page to be in dark mode as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. That is some of the feedback we got early on that people really appreciated that it was dark ish mode generally dark mode okay all right and then um i talked about redesigning the graphs this is what i've mm -hmm. created now um i know that some are tables but it would they would all essentially have the same structure where the title is here and then the content and then any other information to filter the contents mm -hmm. would be 
So yeah, unfortunately with that about graph button and the like the options up top for like Plotly, that's those the like you see like the picture, the different like at least we see now like those different um, options that users have to like select the visualization or take a picture. Those are inherently built into a Plotly visualization. The about graph button is something that we've built ourselves. And so it's, we can't insert the about graph button into that like pre-built, um, those like pre-built Plotly options. Okay. okay we couldn't then I do that. Me, so. But what we could do is we could define the graph card to have an upper shelf thing with the title and the about graph. And then the Plotly options would just be a part of the graph below it. We okay, could do so that. Can... Uh, just I, I, are you sure? I don't know that. Are you sure that's possible? To my knowledge, yeah, it's possible. Okay. Because um, the about graph, um, like we would just essentially create a new div, put those two elements in it, then the graph object, and then the radio options at the bottom. So the about graph can likely stay at the top, but it would be like uh, like the title and then the about graph thing and then the figure itself with its tools and then below it, you'd have the radio items and stuff. Hmm. I don't think I fully like understand how this would look. Sure. So like this. It would just be moving that here. just like, I wish I could show you where my cursor is, but in the actual panel where the graph is, those like the little plotly thing and the picture icon would be in that section, like below the header at the top, below the header section at the top. So okay. in the top right. No, like in the, okay, in the top right before? of the graph area. Yeah, but like below the, below the line. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly okay. right, yeah. That's where it would end up being. Same with like the picture thing. Yeah. That's just where Polly puts everything. Yeah, you've done a much okay. better job. Of, that's what I was trying to verbalize earlier and not doing a... Because yeah, because those mm. like, options are like a part of the graph itself. Yeah. Um, which is kind of confusing to verbalize. Yeah. Yeah. All right. But otherwise, and, we, and... we could implement that as it currently is. Okay, and then um, just to clarify, all of this as um, is the show on hover, the camera and the icon, as it currently is, on Ogo's website. Say that again. Uh, so oh. on the Matrix platform, both of these icons would show on hover, and yeah, here, that's the intention here too. Right. And I actually think that they're visible. They're always visible. They're not just shown on hover. Oh, okay. Uh, when I tried it, I thought they should like that. Yeah, uh, I can't remember exactly. I'm just bringing it up right now. Uh, and then of one more thing going is slow. we talked about. Hmm. Okay. Go ahead, Lami. Sorry. No, no, you can't go on. It's no, you, changing. You... Okay. Um, we talked about taking out the filter icon, so I've taken that out now, but um, that leaves the help um, the GitHub filter at and the help buttons, and the intention now is that when they click, when users click the um search box mm -hmm. this shows here and then um the github in bot filter i would also put it double sorry i thought it was already here then it will be like this uh yeah and the github bot filter is always on by default mm -hmm. Okay, I'm okay, not sure yeah. if we could implement it exactly how it is right there. 
but the spirit of it we could probably come pretty close to all right the the drop down itself is a pretty well baked component right now so it's hard to extend it to do what you're suggesting there but when you see we the can drop, do something the search drop down for what's available james yeah yeah mm. it's it's already a it's a react component from the mantine library that's just wrapped in some extra plotly stuff so adding something like that would be pretty custom that being said it's not impossible to do something similar visually so mm. i would just have to think about it not ideate on it mm. i think um for next week or before next week i would create a prototype so that we can actually walk through the websites to see how um, interactions would be just to um, get your thoughts on um, the different interactions and then to see how I can refine the design if needed <laughs> to see what you can build. Um, okay, we talked about taking out the filter icon. So I took that out. And then for repo overview and code base, um, I can't remember how exactly it was, but I know that you have to, um, the visualizations show for individual repositories, even if you search for multiple ones at once. Yeah. In that yes. sense. That's right, because yeah. the um, metrics don't really apply at the larger scale. They're about what's in a specific repository. Is that right, Kelly? Yeah, I would say like, that would make a lot of sense to have that additional search bar there on those mm -hmm. pages. Like yeah. up above. So this is for repositories that have already been searched for here. They would be populated here. And then only those ones can be selected from here. Yeah, that's really good. Um, Then I created some logos. This is the current it not logo. And I was thinking maybe changing it a bit would... Yeah be a good idea so let me know which ones you i like the one where it looks like the eight is being dragged behind the horse of the knot <clears throat> we're pretty i don't know what least... james, yeah i was just saying, i don't know what james um consider like there is somebody on our team who spent a lot of time on the logo and so i don't i think it might come off poorly on our end if we end up changing it after the time that they yeah. okay. So I think my preference would be to stick with our existing logo, rotating it so it's an eight rather than like an infinity symbol is pretty reasonable. Um, we also have like, we have a, a tiny, tiny bit of brand identity because now we have stickers. So, um, okay. So this yeah, we one, can work. We, if I don't know. And so. so it's like it's, uh, yeah, it's right now it's it's right now I think my only criticism is it's so small that you can't read it. Yeah. Okay. And some of these alternatives do look like they would lend themselves more easily to being a bit larger. You know, we can work with our colleague on it and talk yeah, through yeah. it and see if he has if he has the bandwidth and would be interested in like workshopping it with us a little bit. He did put yeah a lot of time and effort into this logo and then the one that we use for the greater project structure. So um it's a lower priority for me. Yeah, yeah it's not say, the highest priority. Yeah, a lot of time as we're talking through this, I know at least mentally, I almost am already starting to group things as like stage one, stage two, stage three. And that's kind of how once I know there's some things that Lamy said you wanted to do going into next week, probably the next iteration off of that. Once we like what the we're all kind of on the same page on the design of figuring out, OK, what is that first round? 
these are major structural changes that we need to do all at once. What is, what are the, what is that? What is the stage to like the like next round of really enhancing this, this product and then getting to stage three where we feel like it has gotten all the way to the mature point design wise that we want. So then it's more manageable chunks and we can go, um, we can go at it that way. So I think trying to look at it and do it all at once is going to be a, mm, you're just going to get into that infinite, like, queuing system that never things don't get done yeah mm -hmm. all right but i i i do appreciate the work you've done on that so far yeah i and i understand the need for placing priorities on things uh okay so i'll try to work faster next week i was actually hoping to get some people interested in contributing but um, it was talked about during our last Chaos Africa meeting. Yeah. And I'm not sure we have anyone willing to join. So I would take this on as, as if I'm the only one working on it and work faster. No, I mean, work at, <laughs> you don't have to work, work faster. Speed, yeah, work at the speed that um, like, Works for you. makes sense for you. Like, that's, yeah, definitely. I don't feel like we're sitting here waiting for this design to be able to start working on implementing it we definitely have a couple of weeks worth of things that we need to do before either one of us would be able to um uh, like work on the technical implement implementation of it so small iterative steps each week that we talk about that's that's how i view things going forward and if we do it any faster it, it's not going to change the other li like engineering time limitations yeah all right thanks Totally. Yeah, and uh, I think we're actually out of time. So, Lami, if you think it would be helpful for any of us to come to the Chaos Africa meeting to talk about this, let us know. Otherwise, mm -hmm. we really appreciate the work that you're doing. This is fantastic. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, Sean, if you have a second, I have a quick question. Uh, I do. I do. I'm going to declare this recorded meeting of yeah. All Great Not Over. Thank you, Lami. Thank you, James. Um, I'm going to try to figure out, well, if I stop sharing, all the buttons will restore. So this is the end of the recorded meeting. Bye-bye. Yeah, I just wanted to ask.